Hey everyone, I'm Don Cameron with Price Modern and this is the Designer Studio. We are once again in Hayworth's beautiful downtown DC showroom and joining me today on the Designer Studio is Karen Giaconda, Senior Associate at Perkins Eastman. Karen, Hi. welcome to the studio. Thank you. So we're switching things up with you. Yeah. We are going to go right into our five very famous questions. Let's hit it. Okay, so it begins with a, a softball. What's your least favorite color? My least favorite color is the green that I painted on my apartment wall when I was like 23. And it was this like hideous green color that was half off at Home Depot. And I'm like, I'm going to get that deal. And I had to live with it for two years. And it was just disgusting. And I left it with my apartment. So you were a young designer at the time. Right, but I was also poor. So you want the nice things, but you can't have the nice things. Get what you get. Let me just like, I'll, I'll explain what happened in that room. So the window wall has the hideous green paint, right? Not where you typically put an accent wall, but that's what I did. I had an oversized couch and an oversized chair that were like garbage. The flooring was like this white pill, uh, God, God knows where it came from. And then the oversized TV, big screen, not 4K, not high def, just gigantic with all black Ikea furniture because I could afford that because it was free. <laughs> and so did it just drive you crazy all the time? It's hideous. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, but some of those pieces went along with me over the years, right? But you, you righted that wrong. And I have overcome, okay. but I have not had nice, nice furniture, right? right? My husband won't let me buy the nice stuff. Oh, eventually. N no, he'll still say that's too expensive. Why do you need that? So, Compromise. It's compromise for sure. Okay, and so how about your least favorite material? So P-Lam, it's a plastic laminate. Yes. It's hideous. Um, I think I said, you know, it's, it's every single texture and material. There's too many choices. It's like this cereal aisle at Giant. Like none of it's good for you. You don't want it. But it's, I spec it all the time. But it kind of relates to your first question. PLAM is one of those things that people do because budget requires or 100%. durability. Or, yeah. Yeah. And so we use it on everything and it's come a long way over the years. But if I could avoid it, I would for sure. Okay. Yeah. How about your, a design influence on you growing up, someone who made you think, yes, this is what I want to do and this is how I want to do it? So, um, me. I am my own your influence. Your own design, okay, okay. <laughs> well, I say that. Um, so, we chatted about this a little bit before. I don't keep up with like who's the best designer, who's the best architect out there. Like I just kind of know what I like. And so when I do design, I typically, you know, I, I create what I'd like to see in a space. And so my house is a good example of that. I've got um, really like neutral. So this is a good example of like a neutral foundation you can build on. You can add color and accessories. And so my house has um, very neutral, it's got like realtors, gray on the downstairs, but then party in the upstairs. We have like all jewel tones, different colors for every bedroom and uh, a lot of whimsy. So in the pre-interview, I didn't tell you this, but I have mobiles in the ceilings oh, yeah. and I have like um, garlands everywhere. I change the garlands out for holidays. So I just feel like it's nice to have things that people ask you about. So. so the things in your life, things around you have influenced you and continue to. And yeah. And I think it's also, I, I mean, I'll go into this a little bit later, but I feel like people turn 18 and there's this expectation you become an adult and right. I don't subscribe to that at all. Yes. Good. <laughs> so I like to have, like, I just finished my Lego Harry Potter castle. It's like this big. How I many? It yesterday. How many pieces was that? Oh, like four thousand or something. Oh my gosh, that's a yeah. That's so a commitment. It was. How I, many pages in the instruction manual? There are four books to oh. put it together. So I just finished that up, and for my birthday, I got the Diagon Alley one. So that'll be the next thing I take on. And I think. I saw, or we talked about the fact that you've done some of those ar architecture series. Like so I have stuff, tons of Lego I, architecture. Yeah, I yeah. love those. So, so it's funny because when kids come to our house, they try to play with them, and I'm like, not those Legos. Yeah, right. And I, I like grab the other box. I'm like, these are okay. 
that is doesn't like why and i'm like i can't explain why now do you super glue them together no 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 i i, I don't Kraken. know that seems like what if i ever wanted to disassemble them and reassemble have you ever disassembled them well of course not but if, right, I, did, but if you did i could okay fantastic yeah. But Fair I have, enough. the biggest one I have is the, um, it's from London. What is it called? The one with the clock tower? The, the parliament? parliament building. Yes. There we parliament. go. That is like this big. And the incredible amount of detail it has with just the structure that you will never see. It has a working clock. Wow. Yeah. And it's pretty intricate design. The, the yeah. wall details, everything. It's beautiful. That took Sits a while. It's on the high shelf. Yes. No one's playing with no. that. No. <laughs> Because when I was a boy, we built Legos and then we destroyed them by throwing things at them. Of course. Them. And I built with like the old sets and we'd make whole like cities and stuff. Right. Now I'm an adult and I can have the nice things. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned Parliament. I wonder if it relates to the next question, which is, uh, what's your favorite piece of design or architecture that you've experienced? Yeah, so... Um, I love art museums. It's one of the things that I do when I go abroad. So we sleep until 10. We go to an art museum, then we eat for the rest of the night. That's kind of the plan. Um, so the two art museums that I brought up, Musée d'Orsay in Paris is just gorgeous. Yes. Um, it's a former train station. And so you walk in and it's just this like magnificent, tall ceilings, beautiful light. And they have all of like kind of the 3D sculpture there. But it has a really great composition too. And you walk into those smaller, more intimate settings to actually see the see artwork. The art, so. Yeah. Um, they also have a lot of impressionist artists there, and that's one of my favorite types of paintings. I don't have it in my house, but I love that kind of artwork. And then um, locally-ish, um, up in Philadelphia, the Barnes Museum is completely different in that it's modern architecture. Right. But it's, it's warm and it's textural, it's neutral, but like you can kind of see that there's depth to it. Um, and then you go into the galleries and it's completely wackadoo. And that's a professional word. Like what they did is they reinstalled all of the artwork exactly how it had been in its former home. And so it's very intricate, like sculptural elements, art elements, different frames for everything. And so it's kind of nice to have the very mellow architecture adjacent to this like, again, wackadoo artwork in space. Um, so I always talk about that as kind of an inspiration for that base palette and then building on that. Whereas Musée d'Orsay is obviously more ornate from the get-go. Right, right. Huge volume of space, beautiful arched windows. Yeah. That, so those are very, those are two very different buildings. Very different. Accomplishing a similar mission. Yeah, for sure. You get that same sort of like, um, expanse and then compression in both of them right, but in right. just very different ways and i think they're good examples of how you can use buildings whether they be older or more modern to like, get the same result and still get a feeling out of someone which is like the whole point right and so you said impressionist art you love impressionist art do, I you, do. do you have a favorite artist uh renoir is the one that would come to mind okay. i also like degas um, they're both French Impressionist painters. Um, and I, I would say that like from the Impressionist perspective, they're my favorites. And now I tend to like go towards more like graphic artists. So one of my favorites right now, her name is L Lisa Congdon. And she's an artist out of um, Portland. She just kind of does feel good artwork. It's really bright colors, like um, very geometric. So that's the calendar I have in my room right now. Um, and I have a piece of her artwork that I got during COVID and it's a tree. I love trees. You can get into that. We can <laughs> and we will. Okay, good. I love trees. And the, uh, so it's a tree and it says stay open. So it was kind of a play on like the politics of the time and also just, you know, being open to new experiences and hearing other people's opinions and stuff like that. So. Now, we have one question left, but you mentioned the tree. Yes. You have a relationship with trees, and you are a citizen... Citizen forester. Forester. Yeah, and I mean, I would say asterisks haven't played the role for a while because I haven't gone to as many tree plantings, but Casey Trees yep. is my absolute favorite nonprofit in the city, and I highly recommend that people do tree plantings with them. Um, their goal is to reforest the city as much as possible. 
Um, so I've been volunteering with them since 2008 and know how to plant a tree and care for it. So if you ever need That's advice. fantastic. I, I think I know how to do the first part of that. Yeah. The second part, not so much. It needs water. Water. So if you subscribe to their newsletter, <laughs> they will tell it. you every, every week if you need to water or not. So, and that leads to your love for sustainability and yeah. we're going to get there. Yeah. But I we'll still have, I will put a pin in it. We'll park that. <laughs> but I still have one question for okay. you, which is if you could design anything, it doesn't have to be a building, uh, what would you design? So uh, I hadn't thought much about it, but the first thing that came to mind was playground. So I'm going to go with playground. Um, I've recently been to a bunch of them and I don't have any kids, but I love kids and I love to play and I'm a kid at heart. So um, we went to one in McLean recently and it's all accessible design super colorful like rainbows everywhere and i'm just in there with my friend's child like playing with them because it's fun but the slides are just a little bit undersized um i also recently we completed a new elementary school john lewis uh, elementary up in 16th street heights and they have two playgrounds they have the little kid playground which is like all scandinavian adorable design with like tiny tables and tiny stools and then they have the bigger kids one which is way cooler than what I had as a kid with like climbing ropes and like yeah. climbing devices and, and a huge slide so we tested it out when we were on tour there you know just to see if the kids would be safe I loved playgrounds as a kid <laughs> and when my son my son is now 13 but when he was the age to go through playgrounds it was a great excuse for me to get back involved yeah. in the playgrounds and I would I would just ask any adult who's had a bad day to get on a swing set. I know, right? right? And yes. It's so fun. And I think that that's one thing that we miss a lot. I brought it up earlier, like an expectation that you're professional and you stay right. in line and you don't have fun. And then when you have kids, you're like allowed to participate on the periphery. Right. But I think that that's silly because it's just like you need to have stress relief. So a playground and a playground that maybe adults could have fun in too. I think that'd be really dope. I love that answer. I love that. I think there's a place in the world for that. Accessible. There's a place in the city for that. <laughs> yes. Adults, children, everybody. Yeah, program. for sure. Like it. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to the sustainability. You're pretty passionate about sustainability. So you're a citizen forester, uh, but you have an idea of one particular thing about sustainability that would really, really help if everybody got on board. Yeah. I believe you're talking about food waste. I am. Are we going to talk about it? Let's do it. Let's do <laughs> so, it. So um, several years ago, I got really anxious about the amount of food that I was wasting because we're designers. We work long hours. I wasn't coming home and I wasn't cooking and I just have all of my produce rotting. And, uh, and it was giving me a lot of anxiety. And I'm like, okay, I can fix this. This is something that shouldn't be stressing me out. So for about six months, I was very deliberate. Like I made sure I ate the food in my fridge. I didn't throw things out. I learned different ways of cooking. I put things together you wouldn't normally put together. And I felt comfortable at that time to start going to like a CSA. Um, and the CSA I selected is Hungry Harvest. It's, it's got a variety of things now. It's gotten a little bit bigger, but you get a produce box once every couple weeks. And it's all the produce that wasn't big enough or small enough or pretty enough to be sold at a giant. Right. So now I have the, okay, I cook everything that I have in my fridge and I also have this produce that I'm rescuing. And it's really important because it's one of the top, I think in the top three things that people can do to reduce their carbon footprint is just eat the food that we're actually growing. Um, I'm currently reading The Omnivore's Dilemma, which is controversial in, in some circles, so I won't get into maybe why that is, but they do talk about the life of a piece of corn or of wheat, and it's a lot of process and carbon. So I'm passionate about that because it's something that you can control and, um, and something that you know we all should have a little bit of respect for. And I also think like something else that stresses me out is going to the giant. So I don't have to go anymore. Like I get most of my food delivered um, with produce and I just go to the small bodega. So having like, again, that more like intimate control over your food on the daily is less stressful. And so going to a large grocery store stresses you out because... It's overwhelming. Uh, uh, choice. There's so many uh, choices. So, yeah. uh, you don't necessarily know where it's coming from. There's a lot of things like 
we shouldn't be eating out of season, let alone at all right. in this country. Yeah. Um, and the people there, I don't know about you. I feel like maybe I'm invisible at the grocery store. I get run into and bumped and stuff. And so COVID didn't help with that. Um, but pretty much any aisle aside from the loop is just corn is what it actually comes down to. It's all corn. <laughs> that's just been processed and processed and then put into boxes and then delivered to us. So in addition to us, like, just eating one thing that is highly processed, we're also contributing to the waste side of it too. And so in our industry, sustainability has been a big buzzword for you know a, a couple of decades now, but it's really difficult. I think architecture's gotten better at making buildings that have less of an impact on the planet. I think manufacturers have control, you know, in our business, furniture manufacturers are doing a good job of trying to use recycled materials and trying to ha run factories that are zero waste to landfill or, or really, uh, and purchasing offsets for certain energy that they use. But once things start to leave the factories and come to site, it gets really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we still see a lot of products go to landfill. And, and I, th I think it's a challenge that everyone's trying to solve for now. It's a little bit of a premium to be a good steward to the environment right now. Do you see that scale tipping a little bit? hopefully? So I think that it's a mindset that everyone has to change. Yeah. I'll give you an example of just how I got to the interview today. So I, um, I was real stressed out about what I was going to wear because you, you always want to look good. And uh, so I only shop for clothing online now. Uh, and specifically, I only shop for clothing that has been like upcycled or has been pre-owned. So this dress is pre-owned. And it didn't fit a week ago, but I was like, well, got to wear this dress. So I had it tailored. So I had the dress tailored. My shoe, what you can't see is that uh, it has a little chunk out of it. So I put some marker on it earlier today. There you today. go. And so I think that some, some of it is like you just have to be prepared to have things that aren't completely new all the time and value that it has been reused. Right. So we see that a lot in like building arts where we're turning old office buildings into condos or Walmarts into something else. And we're, I think that everyone needs to just kind of recognize new doesn't mean better and start bringing that into kind of all aspects of their lives so that we're talking less about recycling or weight or trash and more about like how long could this chair last? Could I keep it in good repair? For forever. Right. And I think that's one thing that I really value. So I work in K-12 education design. And what I value about it is the buildings we're building are for 50 or 70 years. So we know that over the life of that building, it needs to be, you know, well maintained and be really resilient and that it just stays in place. And the furniture also stays, right? right. And so I, I find a lot of value in that versus maybe hospitality design where it changes over every five to seven years, right? right. I, I don't think things need to be fresh to be cool. Very good. Well, I, I mean, I think it's an important mindset for us all to have. Hopefully, I think we're headed in that direction. I think we more are. More and more. We see it on more and more projects. And so that's great. And, and uh, thank you for joining us no problem. today. Great answers. And... Great conversation and really important point about sustainability. If you want to work with Karen, please uh, find her at PerkinsEastman.com. And of course, you know where to find us, PriceModern.com. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time right here on The Designer Studio. <laughs>